It's January 23rd, 2008. The day is Wednesday and the time is 9.13 in the morning. On the BBC blog, a man is posting a message on their bulletin board. Anyone knows my dad, Walter Yule, who fought there? It's Bob Yule. He's responding to a first-person account posted on the site by a man named Harold Jones, who fought in the Battle of Kohima in April 1944 during the Second World War. It takes Bob nearly six months to get an answer. But on June 17, 2008, George Boswell from Newton Abbey, UK, replies. Bob was Walter Yule, also known as Napper Yule. If so, my grandfather has a picture of him in black and white. His actions are folklore around these parts. Bob is quick to reply. George Boswell? Yup. My dad was known as Napa. I lost him when I was a youngster of 15 and would welcome any news. April 1944. In Europe, the Allies were mounting the final offensive against Nazi Germany. In Asia Pacific, one after the other, Malaya, Jakarta, Singapore, and Rangoon had fallen to the Japanese. Now Japan was planning to march into India and cut off Allied supply lines to China. To counter Japan's Pacific advance, a Southeast Asia command had been created under Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten. I've come here to have a look at you and to let you have a look at me. Not that I'm particularly proud of my mug, but we must get to know each other because we're all part of Southeast Asia command now. One big Allied effort. Reporting to him were three commanders-in-chief for sea, land, and air. And next in line was General William Slim, commander of the 14th Army, given the responsibility of halting the Japanese land invasion into India. Helping him in this was General Wingate, whose irregular forces, the Chindits, were successfully operating behind Japanese lines, harassing their supply lines. The Dakotas, mainly piloted by daring British and American pilots, provided crucial air support, often flying alarmingly low to ensure accuracy. The local Naga population, too, helped out considerably, providing information and intelligence about Japanese troop movements. On the Japanese side, there was General Renya Mutaguchi and his 15th Army. Under him were General Yamauchi, General Sato, and General Yamagida. Adding further firepower to the Japanese offensive was Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose and his Indian National Army hoping to wrest precious Indian territory from the British. And so, in a corner of northeastern India, beside the Burma and China border, several thousand soldiers and their war machines were marching towards a historic encounter, a battle that would play a decisive role in the amphitheater that was World War II. General Slim had been building up logistical bases and stockpiling supplies at Imphal and Dimapur for the last 18 months, planning the reconquest of Burma. He knew this was crucial to victory, as in that hostile jungle terrain, supplies were a critical issue. Also, 
with the superior Allied air power, he was confident of keeping supply lines intact. But there was overconfidence on both sides. The British were sure that because of the hostile terrain, the Japanese attacking forces would be small in numbers and easy to overcome. In this, they completely underestimated Japanese determination and endurance, as well as the INA's courage. And the Japanese too were no less overconfident. Very sure of their ability to defeat the Allied forces, they traveled light, carrying hardly any supplies, depending completely on their being able to capture British lines and use their stocks of food and equipment. A conscious strategy that had worked brilliantly for them in Singapore and Burma, but which the British were now aware of and prepared to counter. General Slim and his 14th Army began now compressing themselves into dense, impenetrable perimeters, presenting a steely defense. Now, all that remained was for time, supply problems, and distance to start taking their toll on the Japanese forces. To fully appreciate how the Japanese were able to fight so fiercely, so far from home, in alien territory, among a population that was often hostile to them, we need to understand the background these brave soldiers came from. Bushido, the way of the warrior, was the concept that ruled the hearts and minds of the Japanese. A code of chivalry that expected each Japanese soldier to fight unto death. Indeed, the families of the soldiers often conducted funeral rites for them before they even left Japan. In the midst of all these clashing ideals, in the impending maelstrom of war, these players marched towards what would later become known as the bravest, fiercest fought battle of World War II. And so, there we have about 2,500 British troops in the area of Kohima, with convalescent and non-combatant men among them too, not quite prepared for more than 13,000 strong Japanese force bearing down upon them. Hello. Let me give you an insight into how the Battle of Kohima took place. Here we are in Kohima right now. Such a lovely, lush, green hillside. So calm, so peaceful and quiet. Rich with bird song. Yet, in those months of 1944, this was filled with smoke, gunfire and artillery. You could smell the stench of death and fear mingled with pain. You also had the all-pervasive smell of raw courage, undying hope, uncomplaining endurance, which together spelt quiet heroism. Such was the battle for Kohima. The Japanese were closing on to Kohima. More than 13,000 desperate men willing to give their lives for their country and emperor. Along with them were the INA led by Subhash Chandra Bose, imbued with patriotic fervor and equally willing to give the last drop of blood for their country. And controlling this area, scattered in different pockets, were the British forces supremely confident that the invading Japanese forces would be small and easily defeated. The Japanese offensive commenced 6th of March 1944. Three Japanese divisions, the INA, 
one tank regiment and other troops were deployed. The objective was to capture Imphal, break through into the Brahmaputra Valley, cut off the northern front and disrupt allied air supplies into China. Behind me is the hut in which General Sato stayed for a while during the battle. The Japanese planned to surround Kohima, cutting off allied forces from access to the Imphal road. The approaches to Kohima were covered by one allied battalion, the newly formed Assam Regiment, with detachments from the Assam Rifles and the local armed police. Late in the day on 4th April, the 4th Battalion of the Royal West Kent Regiment arrived. Colonel Hugh Richards was appointed to organize the defense of Kohima along with men from the Assam Regiment. It was on this small band of about 800 soldiers that the hammer of the Japanese attack fell. By the morning of 6th April, Kohima had been surrounded, cutting it off from the Imphal Road and Dimapo. The siege of Kohima had begun. The bulk of Japanese forces had come in from the Imphal Road. General Sato's forces had secretly crossed the Chindwin and moved towards Kohima through jungle trails. Suddenly, the Allied forces realized that Japanese strength was far greater than what they had planned for. Well. When we think of opposing forces clashing in battle, we think of a wide open space. The battle for Kohima took place in hilly jungle terrain where the trails are narrow and the undergrowth is dense. Looking at this beautiful day and this lovely DC's bungalow, it's difficult to imagine the conditions under which both sides fought. If Russia has to contend with general winter, then South Asia has general monsoon. The humid heat, the drenching rain which converts everything it touches into squelchy mud, the leeches, the hordes of mosquitoes. Whew. Daunting, isn't it? In fact, General Slim had expressly forbidden bathing after sunset purely to reduce the excessive cases of malaria. Of course, now in the trenches, water was short. Shaving and washing were forbidden. And by 6th April, Colonel Richards had rationed water down to one mug per day. There was no tea. The fighting took place in many small pockets. It was decided to hold the Kohima Ridge as the main feature. Garrison Hill, Cookie Picket, Clubhouse, Naga Village, Jail Hill. These were some of the spots which saw some intense fighting. Each trench was fiercely held. The Japanese ran up the hillsides, screaming out their war cries, chucking phosphorus grenades as they approached. Suicide bombers threw themselves into British bunkers. Snipers tied themselves into trees, picking off the British soldiers whenever they moved. Very often, the fighting on both sides was so close that British airdrop of supplies would land into Japanese hands. And often, British bombers would injure their own troops accidentally. Incidentally, we are standing here next to a tank which was used during the Battle of Kohima. It can be seen right here in Kohima even today. It was to be an intense test of endurance and courage on both sides. With the Allies staunchly hanging on, the Japanese had no access to supplies. They were reduced to eating bamboo shoots, grubs, and whatever else they could forage from the jungle. Starved, ill, weak with hunger, retching from eating wild grass soup. The Japanese clung on fiercely, fighting for every inch. The siege of Kohima lasted 16 days. There was hand-to-hand -hand combat in the garden of the deputy commissioner's bungalow. The bungalow doesn't exist anymore. Behind me is the famous tennis court, the east end of which was held by the Japanese and west by the British. Instead of tennis balls, hand grenades were being lobbed back and forth. 161 Brigade was held up at Jotsoma, short of Kohima. From a distance of three kilometers, they put down very accurate fire onto Japanese positions, 
giving the British garrison at Kohima much needed breathing time and fire support. Positions were lost, recaptured and then lost again. Defence perimeters began to shrink. Garrison Hill, including the tennis court, was only 350 square yards of territory. Trench after trench was filled with British and Indian dead. Yet the Allies clung on by sheer grit till reinforcements came. On 19th April 1944, a few hundred ragged, exhausted, wounded and dying British and Indian soldiers came down a hillside in Kohima. For two weeks, this small handful of soldiers had held off over 13,000 Japanese infantrymen to hold the line at Kohima. Their positions had now been taken over by reinforcements who had broken through the Japanese blockades to relieve them. The siege of Kohima was now over. Mount Batten was to describe this as probably the greatest battle in history. And in effect, the Battle of Burma, the British Indian Thermopylae. It was the one stroke that decisively put victory on the side of the British. But the Battle of Kohima was far from over. Fighting went on for control of the various positions. The Japanese held on in spite of heavy rain and severe food shortages. Finally, on 5th June, an outflanking flank attack at last forced the Japanese off the Aradura Spur at Kohima and into retreat. After 64 days of fighting in mud, rain, fire and blood, the Battle of Kohima had finally been won. The British 33rd Corps continued to push south and on 22nd June, Leading troops of the 2nd Division going southwards met the infantry troops of the Indian 5th Infantry Division advancing north from Imphal at Milestone 109. The road to Imphal was now clear. Why was Kohima so important? The significance of Kohima lay in the access it provides further north into India. Holding Kohima meant that British reinforcements could continue to detrain at the Dimapur railhead and their links with American and Chinese forces could continue undisturbed. The Allies followed the Japanese as they retreated through Burma. The Japanese and the INA had more than 30,000 dead and 23,000 seriously wounded out of more than 84,000 soldiers. The Allies had over 13,000 casualties. Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose was reported missing in a plane crash in Formosa and died later in hospital. General Wingate too was dead in a plane crash. It is impossible to mention names of regiments, battalions, divisions, units, platoons. It is impossible to name each of the thousands of individual acts of unflinching heroism. But 1,387 graves, neatly lined in geometric rows on Garrison Hill in Kohima, quiet and undemanding, are a silent reminder of the terrible war that was fought on these hillsides, now echoing with children's laughter and the inscription over the memorial of the 2nd Division reads, When you go home, tell them of us and say, For your tomorrow, we give our today. Let us remember them with gratitude. Let us not forget the extraordinary price they paid so that we may live in peace. And above all, let us honor their memory by keeping peace alive in our lives and in the lives of those around us in small ways and in great measure, but always to the best of our ability so that heroes like them never have to give up their lives in that terrible act called war. <laughs>